Our subject, how supreme is the Supreme Court? Our theme for the weekend, watch and pray. God is good and all the time. When you say that, do you say God is good because you are required to say that? Or do you say God is good because you have personal experience in your lives? Well, let's try that again. God is good and all the time. The Bible says in Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. When God sent the flood, he was good. When he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire, he was good. When he allowed the Romans to destroy Jerusalem, he was good. When he sent the Israelites into Babylonian captivity, one of the reasons was consistent Sabbath breaking, he was good. When he destroyed sinners by fire, he will be good. God is always good. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says in Psalm 145 verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. In other words, God cannot do something wrong. So on the occasions you and I have been angry with God, we were temporarily insane. That's very serious. We were. And by the way, we ought to apologize to God. You cannot get angry with a God who makes no mistakes. When that same infallible God seems almost endlessly patient with us who specialize in mistakes. And so we say one more time, God is good. And all the time, let me hear the princesses of heaven. God is good and all the time let me hear the princes and the rulers God is good and all the time let me hear the whole family God is good and all the time thank you for that for God you're a very good looking audience thank you for that may I count myself as one of you <laughs> well why not who is with us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? We had one last night, Sister Jasmine. I don't know if she's here again. Where is she? Where is she? Where? Where? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Blessings, blessings, blessings. I saw your hand. Would you kindly stand? Tell us your name, please. What's your name? Your name is? Somebody shout it for me. Monica. Hello, Monica. How are you? You look nice this morning. Who invited you? Your son. Your son. What's his name? David. David. Ah, good Bible. Now, David, stand up. Let's take a look at you. Come on, say amen for David. Amen. David, thank you for bringing your mother, sister Monica, my good sister. We're delighted you accepted the invitation. Thank you, and may God bless everything you do. Brother David, May the Lord bless you and give you a good-looking wife. Let the church say amen. All right, Brother David, good man, sharp-looking brother. Anyone else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you're with us. May I see your hand? Anyone else? Anyone else? You may be hiding somewhere. We're always honored to have non-Seventh-day Adventists with us. All right, before I get into the message, which is, how supreme is the Supreme Court? Please turn your phones off. I know you have them. How many of you were here last night? You heard my ranting and raving? What's this? What's that? What is this not? This is not a Bible. Always remember that. So please uh, turn your phones off. Another reason why this is a better choice. WhatsApp is not on this. WhatsApp. You've never heard of WhatsApp? Well, it's in Michigan. It's not in California. You don't have WhatsApp. Do you have Skype in California? Skype is not on here. Email is not in this Bible. Are you with me? 
what am I saying? When you use this as a Bible and you open it to find a text, you may be tempted to see who sent me a text. And it will not be Jesus. <laughs> but when you open this, all you have is the right kind of text. Can you say amen? amen. Use this. Bring this, but use this. And the one people should see you have is this. Not that. No one tries to steal this. They'll try to steal that. So let them see this and not that. All phones are off. I expect and hope you accommodate my request. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And I mean that from the foundation of my soul. Pray for me. And favor number three, I want you to think, not I, God. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Mark 12, reading from verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, Jesus reasoned, Acts 17, verse 2, Acts 18, verse 4, Acts 24, 25, Paul reasoned. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for life. We thank you, Father, that we still have freedom to worship. It will not last forever. We thank you, dear God, for this facility made available to us. We thank you for all the organizers whose thinking and planning you guided and led. Dear God in heaven, as we lift up your word, grant us your spirit, who is the spirit of truth. Jesus said in John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Dear God, guide us into truth, I pray. I humble myself before you, dear Father, seeking no glory for myself, but all the glory for your deserving name. Help me, dear God, to speak the truth boldly, but compassionately, for I too am a sinner. In a very special way, bless Sister Jasmine and bless Sister Monica who are visiting with us. We're grateful for their presence. Bless their families. Hear this prayer, dear God, because we've offered it in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. Our subject, how supreme is the Supreme Court? Our theme for the weekend, watch and pray. The sponsoring department, religious liberty. Keeping this in mind, religious liberty, we'll focus on the word liberty at some point in the message. Let us go to John 19. We shall read from verse 1. We're reading from the King James Version of the Bible, John 19, reading from verse 1. I can still hear pages turning, which is good. You have John 19 reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Now Pilate was a Roman official. He had the power of life and death. 
he asked Christ a direct question. Whence art thou? Where are you from? And perhaps by implication, who really are you? What is it you want? But Jesus gave him no answer. Christ was not intimidated by the power of Pilate. And the man or the woman who cannot be intimidated is free. Even though the person may be handcuffed, shackled. Christ gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, verse 10, Speakest thou not unto me? Do you know who I am? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Verse 11, praise God for that verse. It's a verse every Christian should live by. Jesus answered, read it with me. If you have my version, thou couldst have no power at all against me. Finish the verse, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greatest sin. Listen to the words of Christ. Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above what does jesus christ mean given from above given by his father allowed by his father permitted by his father for reasons attached to the glory of the father the republican party can have no power over you at all except God allows them in power. The Democratic Party can have no power at all against Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know about the rest of the country. <laughs> except it were given them by God. You and I need to understand, we serve a God that controls political affairs. Not your vote. In Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 20, when God revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Daniel, in verse 20 of Daniel 2, the Bible says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now, the United States is the most powerful military power on the face of the earth. The Bible says wisdom and might belong to God. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. When we do not understand that, we begin to stress over who's in power. And we argue. Democratic Adventists argue with Republican Adventists. And there's splits and divisions in the church. Yet we serve a God who controls the strings of politics in this country and in the world. Amen. Listen to Daniel 1, reading from verse 1. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, a secular historian will study the sources and write a book and say, the military might of the Babylonians was greater than the defenses of the Israelites, and so the Israelites lost. No, the Bible says God gave the Israelites into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Jericho was the most heavily fortified city of the ancient world. Let me say that again. Jericho was the most heavily fortified city. Rahab lived on the wall. The walls were thick, but God gave Jericho to the Israelites. We serve a God who controls every, every earthly power is under the control of God. And so when Jesus stood before Pilate, he stood before the might of the Roman Empire. And he was not intimidated. 
My brothers and sisters, how supreme is the Supreme Court? As a church, we teach that someday in the future, a Sunday law will be passed. Hmm? Yeah. Making Sunday observance required by law. When that law is passed, then decisions have to be made between the law originating from heaven and the law originating from the earth. When people make that choice, that's when we'll have people who will have the mark of the beast. At this point, no one has the mark of the beast. Are you with me? Because there is not yet a legal requirement to observe Sunday as the Sabbath day. But when that law is passed and the test comes, those who bend to an earthly law are the ones who will be in bondage. Those who realize I serve a God who controls my destiny, they're the ones who will choose to serve God regardless of circumstances. And I submit to you, that kind of attitude is freedom. And so Jesus stood before Pilate, the might of the Roman Empire, the greatest empire at that time, and he told Pilate, you could have no power at all. Not even a little power. No power at all except. Let me narrow it down, make it more personal. If you're faithful to God, listen to me carefully. If you're faithful to God, you obey Him from the heart. His will is your highest joy. If you're being harassed on the job, God has allowed it. But remember the conditions I laid down, if you're faithful to God. You know, Peter said in 1 Peter 4.15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. That's not the way the Christian should suffer. If the Christian suffers, let it be, because he or she is faithful to God. And God allows that person to be tested. And so Jesus said, you can have no power against me, except Christ was free could not be intimidated could not be threatened could not be cowed into submission christ stood in the liberty wherewith his father had made him free you know galatians 5 1 paul says stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith christ hath made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage where the spirit of god is second corinthians 3 17 there is liberty freedom you can be in chains and free. And this weekend is celebrating religious liberty. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3 now. Our scripture reading, we shall read from verse 8. It is, what time is it? 1. Okay. When do I end? All right, I got about 12, 36, 37. That's what I looked at. But uh, we'll see how merciful I'll be. All right, Daniel chapter 3. We shall read from verse 8. That's 8. Well, let's read from, well, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near or drew near and accused the Jews. Remember Nebuchadnezzar made an image. He said, everyone bow. Three boys refused to bow. Some Chaldeans observed them and they came and said, listen, these boys not bowing. They spake and said to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. That's up to verse 11. Verse 12. There are certain Jews. Listen again to the words of the Bible. There are certain Jews. The verse doesn't say there are all Jews. Because most of the Jews were doing what? They were bowing. <laughs> there are certain Jews whom thou hast set 
over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There are certain Jews. If you look at verse 8, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans drew near. There are always certain Chaldeans and certain Jews. There are those who are faithful and there are those who set out to make their lives miserable. Question for you, don't answer me. Are you among the certain Jews? Let's drop Jews. We're in the last days. All key people, nations, and languages have been called to observe a day set up by Congress as a holy day. Now, can God say there are certain Adventists who absolutely refuse to bow? Regardless of loss of job, loss of house, loss of income, loss of prestige, loss of social support, loss of family. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the kingdom of Babylon, the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. That's not disrespect. To disregard is not to disrespect. If the government passes the law and says, you know, you can kill your neighbor, I will disregard that law. Are you following me? They regard, it, they regard not thee, neither do they, they worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man back then. He did not rule by committee. The Bible says he killed whom he wanted to kill. He released whom he wanted to release. When Daniel refused to eat the food, the prince of the eunuchs was nervous because he said, the king will cut my head off if you don't eat what he recommends. And so Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I like the question. Is it true? Do we not serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. By the way, I have set up, he has set up, recurs almost 11 times in the first 18 verses of Daniel 3. Is it true? The world will ask us very shortly, is it true Seventh-day Adventists don't work on Sabbath? What should we say? Yes, it's true. Will all of us be able to say that? No. Why? Because some of us work on Sabbath. And what's the reason? I have to survive. Is it true that Seventh-day Adventists place a premium on the health message? What should we say? Yes. Will all of us be able to say yes? No. Is it true? Seventh-day Adventists believe, be not an equally yoked with unbelievers. Is it true? What should we say? Yes. Can we all say yes? No. Is it true that there are conferences that discourage the use of Ella White's writings? Sadly, the answer is yes. I was in a certain country on the face of the earth. I was staying with a minister in that country. And he told me something I could not believe. The conference had circulated a document requiring all the ministers to sign, I will not quote Ellen White from the book. Is it true? that Seventh-day Adventists disregard Ella White's counsel, the painful answer is yes. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar said, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Verse 15, Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. It is never well to engage in idol worship. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. If you do it, that's well. But if not, ye shall be cast the same hour into a burning fiery furnace. Finish the verse with me. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Who? You know, sometimes we are in the midst of circumstances and we see no way out. Forgetting we serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. Amen. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, I'd like to see that God. You know, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? And then the Lord showed him. And it was very, very painful. God showed Nebuchadnezzar in the very next chapter who he was. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, verse 16, Daniel 3, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. As you heard last night from Dr. Reisinger. But if not. You know, I like those words very much. God needs a lot of but if nots in the church. But if not. Be it known unto thee, O king. Now, I loved, is it true? I also love, be it known. You know how many Christians hide who they are? And it's not known. And because it's not known, many people never see the light of God's love. And by hiding your Christianity, by hiding your Adventism, you deny someone the privilege of observing Adventism in operation. And so the three boys said, Be it known unto thee, O king, we want you to have no confusion, no misunderstandings. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In other words, there is nothing you can do. Now, to take that attitude, as Jesus took with Pilate, the three Hebrew boys with Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel with Darius, in Daniel 6 you must lose the fear of death do you know the fear of death is the worst form of slavery listen to Hebrews 2 verse 14 15 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the death, that is the devil, verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. A man who is afraid to die is a slave. As long as the devil sees I am afraid to die, the devil has the most powerful weapon to use against me and that's the threat to my life. Remember what the devil said to God? Skin for skin, all that a man hath, will he give for what? His life. He was wrong about Job. He was wrong with a capital R. Is that how you spell wrong? He was wrong with a capital R. Wrong. Okay, okay, put the W. He was just wrong. Let me tell you something about the devil. The devil is afraid of believers who are not afraid to die. Ah, you didn't hear me? You're sleeping with your eyes open. You didn't hear me. The devil is afraid of believers who are not afraid to die. Because the threat of death is his most powerful weapon. And so the three Hebrew boys said, listen, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 19, Daniel 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the former's visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded 
that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. <laughs> now at that point, I might have changed my mind. <laughs> if I had a choice of death, let me tell you what I would not choose. To be eaten by a bear. Huh? <laughs> I wouldn't choose that. I mean, where does he bite first? I don't know. I would not choose to be burned in fire. I would choose lethal injection with a sanitized needle. Are you with me? I don't even want a scar where the needle is. I want laughing gas. Something, what's the word I'm looking for? Painless. And quick. Instant. I'm gone. Don't even know I'm gone. But burn in fire? Eaten by lions? The lion eats half of you, takes a nap, and comes back to eat the other half, and you're not dead? The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar warmed up that furnace seven times more. Now in the Bible, seven means what? Completion, perfection, totality. That was as hot as it could get. It was so hot, the Bible says, it slew the men that took up Shadrach, which means, and this is just what I'm seeing, here comes these tall soldiers, verse 20. He commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here come these brawny men, six foot nine, and they're pulling Shadrach, Meshach, and the fire is so hot, the men drop dead. Before they get to the mouth of the furnace. Then what happened? Those three men said, you want to kill us? Fine. <laughs> they walked in. They walked in. I'm not afraid. Did not some martyrs go to the stake singing hymns? Yes. Did not Peter ask to be crucified upside down according to tradition? Yes. Did not Peter and John leave the Sanhedrin rejoicing they had been chosen to suffer for Christ? Listen to Jesus Christ. This is my commandment that ye love one another. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man, finish it for me, lay down his life for his friends. Now Christ is saying, I have given the greatest demonstration of love. I gave my life. Now, there's a difference between giving your life and being killed. Now oh, you missed it. You missed it. Let me try again. It's my fault. Christ gave up his life. That's voluntary. Being killed is not voluntary. Uh, some of you still didn't get it. Let me try again. I'm walking down an, a dark road with my wife. Here comes a guy with a gun, points it at my wife. So I step between him and the gun, her and the gun. Kill me. Leave her alone. That's giving your life. I'm walking down the road with somebody else. Guy sticks a gun. I take off running. The fellow shoots me. <laughs> no, I'm dead. Are you with me? But I didn't give up my life. Are you following me? <laughs> I took off like a jackrabbit, but he shot me. Now I died, but I did not give up my life. I was trying to save it. But freedom allows you to say, here is my life. And so Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he says in uh, verse, uh, 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And Jesus says in John 10, 16, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, John 10, 18. I have power to lay down, I have power to take it up again. Jesus is clear, I am not going to be killed, I will lay down my life. 
This is freedom. Nothing intimidates. Why? Because there is a higher power that controls the strings of my destiny. And until you and I learn to live in trust in that power, we will be worried, we will be stressed, we will age before our time, we will misbehave, we will misunderstand, we will neglect spiritual things as we try to protect ourselves, forgetting there is a God who specializes in protecting his people. The greatest expression of love is death. Not murder, death. Voluntary, willing death. And Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Then he goes on to say, ye are my friends. If you do, whatsoever I command you. How many friends does Jesus have here today? Can I see your hands? Okay, he doesn't have some friends among us, hands down. <laughs> Let me ask you a serious question, don't answer me. If you were required to give your life for Christ now, would you do it? God bless you, my brother. I'm not joking. At any point in the Christian's life, God may decide, show how much you love me. And Christ is clear, the greatest expression of love is laying down the life. That is freedom. The United States is the greatest military power on the face of the earth, but they can't stop suicide bombers. With all the technology, satellites in space, that can read a number plate on a car, they cannot stop suicide bombers. My amateurish theory is, no one can stop a person who is willing to die. They have nuclear submarines, and I've been in one. They have Apache helicopters. They have F-16, F-17, F-18, F-19, F-20. Battleships, aircraft carriers, little cities afloat. Can't stop one human being with a bomb strapped to his chest. Why? Because that man is not afraid to die. And so the intimidation factor does not exist. If you're willing to die for God, surely you're willing to do whatever God says. You can't be willing to, God, to die for God and not willing to return a tithe. It makes no sense. Are you with me? A willingness to die tells God, I am willing to do every other thing that is less intense. <laughs> ah, you're laughing at the preacher. <laughs> am I making sense? Yes. The willingness to die is the ultimate proof that you love God and I love God. On this religious liberty weekend, and our willingness to die for our faith is that death that God treasures. There are young men who die for drugs. Hmm? They die for gangs. <laughs> there are people who die for the sake of unprotected sex. Am I telling the truth? People die for all kinds of reasons. Wrong reasons. There are people who die fighting wars they don't understand. God says, die for me. Do not allow any earthly power to so intimidate you that you begin to protect your life regardless of what effect it has on my kingdom. Be willing to die for me. And on this Religious Liberty Weekend, I am saying to you, my brothers and sisters, the greatest freedom you and I can experience is that freedom where no power on earth can intimidate us. We're willing to die for the honor of our God. Amen. This is what God wants in the last days. You know, Babylon no longer exists as a physical city or power. But is a real, it is a reality 
in Revelation. There's this system called Babylon, false teachings. Babylon requires worship, false worship. God has one day of worship, the seventh day Sabbath. God says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Nebuchadnezzar set up an image and he called all people, nations, and languages to bow, meaning the entire world. Of course, the world of the Bible is not the entire physical world, but there will be a greater fulfillment of that when the entire world will be commanded, kneel, bow in acknowledgement of an earthly power. That is when we will either say, yes, I'll bow and save our lives temporarily, or no, I will not bow and run the risk of suffering the death penalty that will be attached to this law. As verily as death was the penalty for not bowing to that image, death will be the penalty for not bowing to the law to come. And so this, eve, uh, this morning or this afternoon, let me close. God wants people who are willing to die for him. Ellen White writes in a Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 13, paragraph 3, Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. Mind, character, and personality, volume one, page 13, paragraph three. Satan takes control of every mind that is not what? Decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Decidedly means no doubt. Not God on weekends, Satan in the week. I mean God seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. God, whether I'm in church, God on the job, God on the playground, God on the bus, God wherever, God, total control of my life. Without that, we are prey to the enemy. And so today I'm asking you, my brothers and sisters, let us ask God to give us the freedom to serve him regardless of consequence. Yeah. Uh, when the flood came, there were eight people who got into the ark. Only eight. When Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, only one righteous man came out of the cities. Now four people came out, one righteous man. Are you with me? The wife became a pillar of salt. The two daughters committed, what's that, sexual crime with their father, so they were not righteous. One righteous man. They did it when he was drunk, so you can't say he participated. One righteous man out of five cities. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. One. When Jesus went back, 120 disciples, 12 in the upper room, others scattered somewhere. What am I saying? Most people turn their backs on God. Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood in, Matthew, in John 6. In verse 66, the Bible says, from that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with them. And he asked them, is this, does this offend you? They said, yes. What you say is too hard. We're leaving. But when you leave Jesus, where are you going? <laughs> to whom shall we go, says Peter. God bless Peter. Where are we going? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Let me stress this and I'll close. The second time I said I'll close, I, need, I usually say it five times. Uh, Peter said, where shall we go? Uh, why did Peter stay? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I don't want to preach two sermons, but the reason to join the church is because they preach the words of eternal life. Amen. Not because the members are perfect, because one of the 12 disciples in the early church was a devil. Jesus said in John 6, 70, have I not chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. Would you not have joined Christ's church just because one was a devil? Peter said, we're staying because you have the words. 
You don't have the largest church. You don't even have a church building. The cars in the parking lot are all old, but you have the words of eternal life. The word of God says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But you will never lay down your life for God if you can't lay down alcohol for him. You will never lay down your life for Christ if you can't lay down that unsanctified relationship you're in. You'll never lay down your life for God if you won't stop violating his holy Sabbath. Because he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. It's a principle by which God functions. We need to lay down our lives in little things every day by denying self. Are you with me? Let me say it again. We need to lay down our lives in little things by denying self. So by so doing, we practice so that when we get to the big test to really lay down the physical life, we are so accustomed to laying down our lives in little things, we lay down our life gladly when the big test comes. In what area do you need to lay down your life? Well, areas differ from person to person. For someone, it may be, I watch too much television. And so it interferes with my ability to understand the Bible. And so I never understand the Bible, and I blame the preacher. You need to lay down your life by focusing on the salvation of your children, not your career. You need to lay down your life by saying, Father, I will obey you. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I will break off that relationship today. Adventist home, page 67, paragraph 1. To connect with an unbeliever is to place yourself on Satan's ground. We need to lay down our lives by changing our diets. We need to lay down our lives by changing our recreational pursuits. We need to change, lay down our lives by changing the way we dress. On the point of dress, let me get into your business. Then I'll stop. That's what, three times? <laughs> Listen carefully to me. Next time you get ready to dress for church, pray. Why are you laughing? Well, listen to me carefully. Pray, stand before your closet, and say, Lord, what would you have me to wear? The Lord may say, none of that stuff. Go get a brand new wardrobe from Walmart. None of that stuff. Now, this is serious. Let me tell you what has been happening to me recently. You won't believe it. I'll tell you. I began asking God, what should I wear? Literally. I take ties in my hand. I say, Father, you know, the wrong tie can turn one person off. I don't like that guy's tie. So I go to sleep. Or the wrong shoe. So I pray and I say, Father, which tie should I wear? What shoe? What socks? This is no joke. The underwear I choose, can you say? <laughs> Are you with me? Nobody sees that. Since I began doing that, people have looked at me in my travels through airports. Are you a preacher? I was leaving Nigeria last November. I had my bag, walked up to the immigration. He said, come prophet. <laughs> You know, prophets are big in Nigeria. So I said, what did you call me? He said, prophet. I said, why? He said, it's clear to me you're a prophet. And he took off his cap. He said, pray for me. And I prayed for him right there at the, at the immigration office. Seriously. I was leaving South Africa uh, three weeks ago, coming through the metal detector. And then one of the security said, you are a preacher from the United States. I said, I said how do you know that? She said, but it's... I was in South Africa again. I was going to, I was doing a crusade on the university campus. And I was, I told my driver, let's pull off from this gas station, let me buy some juice and some gum. You know, people in the United States always chew gum. That's how you identify it abroad, chewing gum. 
And so I went to the little store. I said, uh, have you any juice? She said, yes. So she went to get the juice. It was right next to the liquor and the alcohol. When she brought it, I said, is this juice? She said, yes, I'll never give you alcohol. I said, why not? She said, you're a preacher. I said, how do you know that? She said, but it's clear to me you're a preacher. I went to the very next door, next door to get gum. She had none. The very next door, two feet away. I walked in, hello. There was a guy at the register. He said, hello, preacher. I said, why do you say that? He said, the anointing is all over you. I was on a plane. They looked at me up and down. Yeah, preacher? I said, yes. I was on another plane. The young lady sat next to me. She looked around. Are you a preacher? I said, yes. I said, why do you say that? I said, you look like one. Another plane, lady sat next to me. She said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. She said, oh, I'm glad in case of turbulence, I'm sitting next to you. So I, <laughs> what am I trying to say? When you decide to let God choose your dress as a way of laying down your life, let me tell you something. Fashion is a power in the church that ruins the church. And as I talk about practicing laying down your life, practicing die, I was in a church. I'm about to finish four times. And these women, let me look around before I say anything. I want to get back home alive, no scars. I had never seen heels so high. And I said, Lord, what happened to the word modesty? What happened to the word vulgar? And I looked at this lady, oh, all of them, I said, man, if she wanted to commit suicide, she'd just have to jump off that shoe. <laughs> she doesn't need a tall building. Are you with me? Jump off that shoe. I'm dead. What am I saying? Let's die in the area of fashion. Hmm? Let's lay down our lives and say, Father, I really want to wear this tight thing, but let me die and wear something loose. Lord, I really want to wear this pants. Looks as if someone painted it on me. But let me die and wear something that covers me. Father, I want to wear something that's come down here and the, the waist is up here and the bus line here. But Father, let me die. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Give his life. Are you willing to give your life for Christ in the little things? Listen to me carefully. In the little things. Now you identify your little thing. Your problem may be fashion. Yours may be eating a lot of dead animals. Whatever yours is. Yours may be eat, drinking alcohol when no one is looking. Taking a puff when no one is looking. Gambling on the internet. Whatever it is. Looking at internet sites you should not go to. Whatever area in which we need to die. Can we say, Lord, help me to die in that area. May I see your right hand? Help me to die. Stand up with me. Help me to die in that area. Ah. We need Christians willing to die. The willingness to die, the ultimate freedom. Religious Liberty Weekend. My brothers and sisters, when that law is passed and life is on the line, those who have been accustomed dying for God in little things will gladly die for God in a big thing. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your love expressed in the sacrifice of your Son. And as he himself said in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Dear God in heaven, Jesus experienced the freedom that allowed him to tell Pilate, Thou couldst have no power at all against me. Father, help us to understand that the supreme court of the earth has its limits. It is not as supreme as we think it is. Supremacy lies with you. Pilate had limited power. You have supreme power. 
And so they God take away from our hearts any fear we may feel from earthly supreme courts, from earthly rulers. Let our focus be obey our God, be faithful to our God, that our God may defend us in the time when it's necessary. Father, we've stood to say we need to die in this area or that area or that area. Dear God, give us the courage from on high to die in the areas where we need to give up self. Whether it's diet, dress, working on Sabbath, whatever it is, Father, give us the courage out of love for Christ to die daily, dear God, that when the big test comes, we will give up our lives gladly. Help us, dear God, to put you first in everything we do. Bless everyone who came. Save us when you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen.